scalability, uh, decentralization, privacy, fungibility, making it easier for people to mine on small devices, get more on coins, like a, bu a bunch of uh, kind of metrics sort of that I consider to be metrics of improvement. And so I looked at lots of different, you know, changing parameters, changing design, changing network, changing cryptography. And basically to my surprise, it seemed that almost anything you did that arguably improved it in one way made it worse in multiple other ways. So it made it more complicated, used more bandwidth, made some other aspect of the system just objectively worse. And Bitcoin kind of exists in a narrow pocket of design space. I mean, you know, the, the design space of all possible designs is an enormous search space, right? Counterintuitively, it seems like you can't really significantly improve it. You know, all these old kinds, they don't have any innovation in the sense that, you know, they wanted to do an effect, so they cut some corners, made some trade-offs, and they did it anyway. And each of them is typically objectively worse, typically much worse because of the kind of lower network metrics and so on, right? So they're de facto less decentralized or make, some, make, it, make the system much more complicated. I think a lot of people don't realize that complexity is bad for security and dependability. The Bitcoin just ran from the beginning. The software has changed remarkably, like been refactored, rewritten, optimized, the network protocols optimized. Initial sync time when you start a new node and sync has been completely redone like f four times and is sort of 10,000 times faster than it was at the beginning. People's intuition that, oh, it's the code base is not changing is just wrong. You know, you can look at the code base and see that it's one of the most active open source projects. I think sometimes Bitcoin suffers from like not having a, a marketing department. Um, you know, there is there is no Bitcoin the company. There's no funded uh, Bitcoin like communications or coordinated marketing. And so anything that is discussed is discussed in the open, so people get to see it. You know, see the trade-off discussions. Small group of altcoiners contacted me and invited me to join, you know, to be a co-founder or join their new altcoin. Then it occurred to me like, well, wait a minute, why do they want me to be involved? It's probably because they want you to put your name on it for marketing purposes. So I was like, well, that's kind of uh, not, not very ethical. It's kind of renting your name. It, you know, it's going to burn your reputation and they're going to get the money from it or most of it. Of course, of about like 10 or 15 seconds, I went through the thought process of, well, you know, you could... You know, just fragment this amazing piece of technology and, you know, create a new one, yeah. um, make some money, but actually that would detract from the network effect. It would be kind of destructive and the constructive thing to do and ethical thing to do in my mind is to, you know, improve Bitcoin because, you know, money is a network thing yeah. and this is, this is not a serious endeavor to do this. It's kind of, you know, opportunistic leeching kind of behavior so i was resolved immediately okay that's that's evil i won't you know won't even consider that ever again kind of thing <laughs> dominance index is is kind of a bogus economic metric for the market reasons that you know are in your background in particular that they are illiquid and the obvious fallacy that You've got the unit bias where somebody will create a new coin with a quadrillion units and then, you know, you'll sell me one for a dollar and now we have the highest value coin. But the liquidity is literally zero. So that kind of effect is baked into it. With 10,000 coins, of course, there are many, many highly illiquid coins which, you know, barely have a price or are listed only on a decentralized marketplace or very tiny exchange with no liquidity or basically forgotten or something but they still have a value it's a moving target so there are always new ones you know you it, it would sort of be fairer to take a snapshot of you know some number of coins uh let's say three years ago and then look how that holds up against bitcoin and roll that forwards 
with you know still existing top 20 coins now and, and keep that going because <clears throat> otherwise you're you know it's a moving target right Bitcoin has a lot of interesting features and characteristics. So it, it's, it appeals to different people for different reasons. And the permissionlessness and the fact that you can, you know, just install a piece of software on a smartphone and start transacting globally without, you know, needing anybody's permission or an intermediary is, is um, you know, it's a key differentiator in a, in a, in a way you know, there's a, a sort of concept of a, a differentiated value, which is basically an area where the product is unique and nothing can really compete with it or the incumbents can't compete with it. And I think that that is the sweet point for Bitcoin because conventional financial institutions simply can't do that. Nobody would have imagined that banks would want to be involved with Bitcoin. And now we have, you know, banks offering Bitcoin denominated bank account and, you know, sort of queuing up to get active in the space uh, with Bitcoin as an asset class or Bitcoin secured loans. And I guess the El Salvador news, like the sovereign, sovereign involvement, adoption. you know, there may actually yeah. be some indirectly some sovereign uh, mining or sovereign Bitcoin holdings or, you know, Bitcoin reserves. So earlier on, People thought, you know, oh, that's a pipe dream. That'll never happen. Yeah. But, you know, it, it seems like these things are just keep happening and happening at a faster pace than people imagined.